Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and we're in the final stretch of Library 2.012. Uh, less than eight hours away, a, a work day away from finishing, which is really fun. Some of you have been up as long Really delightful. Thanks again to San Jose State University, the conference uh, partners. Sandy Hirsch is the co the uh, co-chair of the conference. This is a chance for you to let us know where you're participating from. Look for the star icon to the left of the map. The second one down, click on it twice, then click on the map. Give us a shout out, let us know New Zealand, Australia, British Isles, where, where you are exactly, what the weather is. Ooh, looks like Hawaii. New Zealand, I'm hoping that we finally got your time zones figured out. We were laughing about it. You know, there are like, there, David, there are some 36 time zones, depending also on whether or not it's daylight savings time. And, and New Zealand went through the switch this weekend, and we had to correct that. Uh, I had a, a good talk with New Zealand the other week, and it was fun trying to coordinate. Now, which day is that? Okay. Because you only have an hour, we don't want to, I don't want to waste any of your time. We'll turn it over to you now, David. Thank you. Thank you all very much, and thank you, Steve, and thanks for the organizers for having me. This is, this is absolutely wonderful. Uh, my dream someday is that all conferences will be like this so that I don't have to wear pants ever again. But fear not, if, it, if I just put horrible images in your mind, I am wearing pants. Uh, I'd like to talk today about the new librarianship worldview. Um, my name is David Lankus. I have a job. I work at Syracuse University's iSchool. And um, I know the recording will be here. I also tend to put screencasts of all my presentations up at davidlankus.org. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's Artie Lankus, or Facebook, it's Artie Lankus, or LinkedIn, it's Artie Lankus, or Google Plus, Artie Lankus. Or if you want to find me on Scape, it's Artie Lankus, and Flickr, it's Artie Lankus, and on Goodreads, I'm Artie Lankus. And why I keep going on over and over is not to show you how well connected I am. Because have you ever noticed that the people with the most avenues to connect them are the least likely that you want to use one of those? What I wanted to show this to you is because my guess is in your organization, possibly you, but possibly the library you work in, you've got a list like this and it keeps growing and growing and growing. Right? The idea of, well, we're in social media. And, well, we had to be in MySpace when MySpace was here and GeoCities and all these other things. And we still run an island in Second Life. And we're, we're hoping to God that, you know, pretty soon MySpace will come back and all the work we've done there will help. And we keep adding and adding and adding and adding technologies and services, hoping that one of them will be the key to revitalizing libraries as we know them. Uh, libraries have put a lot of faith in technology, and that's not just in the past five years or ten years. Over our history, we put a lot of faith in technology uh, as a means of not just that are serving our communities. That's the noble goal, and it's an important one, and one I'm 100% behind. But let's face it, we've also made some bets on what's cool and trendy. You know, librarians love a good trend to get behind. You know, I, I was in virtual reference days. I was part of the problem for many of these things. You know, before Facebook and such, we had dial-up connections and free nets. And before that, we had microfiche readers. And before that, we were always looking for the new technology that would make us more relevant, would allow us to connect out. But the real problem that libraries have is not the idea of coming up with new ideas, not the idea of coming up with new projects. Now, we can all be better in that. And there's a, there's a real challenge for us to be a creative individual. But this stereotype of librarians as somehow mousy and passive and least and, and resistant and conservative, I think is a completely bogus concept. The trends we jump on may not make the top 10, and we may confine ourselves, but look through your library. Look at their signage. Look at everywhere, and you're going to find jumping to a trend, trying something. Now we've got a commons. Now we've got this. Now we've got that. The problem that libraries have is not coming up with new ideas. We can do better. We can do faster. We'll get to that in a second. The problem we have as libraries and librarians is killing them. 
right? <laughs> the, you know, and, and we can make it sound as nice as we want. We can replace the Grim Reaper with, you know, a happy, fun version of it, but it still doesn't get rid of the idea that one of the things we least like to do is to get rid of ideas and projects. Now, libraries and librarians are hardly the only one to blame about this. I work in an academic setting. We hate giving up projects, you know. What are you doing Thursday night? I'm driving down to Elmira to teach two people from the IBM Research Center that closed 20 years ago because you never know those two people need us. Right? We all have ideas that we want to start and try and incubate and for a whole host of reasons we're really, really bad at stopping them. Right? New projects are hard to start. That's the other thing we realize is it usually takes us a lot of effort to get to the point of even starting the new projects, but they become impossible to kill. Why? Tradition, right? This is the, this is the easy answer. Oh, old fuddy-duddy old-fashioned libraries. Well, traditions, you know, oh, why do you still do the card catalog as well as the online catalog? Because we always did that. Right? Nah, that may be there, but that's more of a stereotype than a reality. I have rarely walked into a library and said, why is this project happening? You're like, well, let me tell you, on August 30th of 1851, you know, in the middle of the night, we, you know, that's not how it works. Sure, there's resistance to getting rid of core services or things that have been defined as core services. We see that through standing dissemination of information. We see that through reader's advisory. We see this idea of resisting getting rid of things because we've always done them. More often than not, we don't get rid of projects for interpersonal skills, right? A good project gets, was usually started by a person or a group of people, and to get a project started, to go through the mess of committees and assignments and budgeting, they had to take a lot of ownership. And as a project gets going, if it's not panning out, or as we'll talk about, it worked really well and then suddenly is not panning out, we don't want to be the ones to hurt someone's feelings. One of the issues that we have in any type of organizations, and libraries in particular, is that we own these things, and there usually is a person associated with them. I had a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant librarian who worked for me, and I'm lucky enough to still have her as a colleague, and her baby, her project that she did brilliantly on, that it was a great project, but it just had to go away. It was not making any, it, it, it was out of money, it was out of support, it was out of users, it just had to go away. It took her over 10 years to get over that. That's a reality that as good people, we don't like causing pain to other good people. Hangers on, the idea that, well, I don't want to try anything new, I just want to keep doing this forever and ever and ever. I was at a, a large academic university and they were talking about revamping, rethinking, redoing their reference. And one of the debates was getting rid of the dreaded reference uh, debate. You know, can we get rid of the de reference desk? And these librarians, you know, it was like, they can take it out of my cold, dead hands, that whole stereotype. And when we sort of talked with them and got to know what was going on, what it was is, if you take this away, what will I do instead? And so the answer to that wasn't to force them to show up one day and have it absent. The answer was to bring some other fabulous librarians from another university who sat there and said, I do two hours of reference on a desk a month. And frankly, I wish I didn't have to do that because I'm busy teaching in consultation with faculty, sitting over. And, and they went through this amazing list and you could see the reference librarians going, oh, that sounds better. And so you need this idea of, you know, if we simply say where it's going away, how do we bring it back? Um, I see bureaucracy in the chat, absolutely. The idea of we've done it, we'll always do it because it takes too much effort to stop it. But the one I want to talk about, the one that's sort of kind of scary, is that it's sometimes hard to kill a project when that project has been so successful in the past. And, and I know that you sit there and you go, well, wait, it worked, it worked, it worked. How are we going to get rid of it? Look, it got us to where we are. Look, it's part of our pride and joy. We have a plaque on the wall. How could you get rid of that? It was successful. And what we have to realize is there's a paradox going on here. There's a paradox of success. The paradox goes something like this. Not only does past success not indicate future achievement. In other words, yes, you were successful. That doesn't mean you're going to continue to be successful. But past success can actually lead to future failure. If we keep trying to do what worked in the past and not take account for the new setting, we can divert resources from new ideas, new thinking, new and better services for our community because we constantly think, well, if that worked before, it'll work again, and it'll work again, and it'll work again. And we just keep sort of trying to recycle this idea and call it new names. And 
I'm going to give you a few examples, right? So the classic example of this is Wikipedia versus Microsoft and Card Hub. I saw Joyce is on here, and I'm sure imagine there are others some school librarians hanging out. My peeps, thank you. And if you'll recall, Microsoft and Carta, this was Microsoft Encyclopedia, the one that quote unquote killed the Encyclopedia Britannica, even though it's still running, was uh, Microsoft bought really a second rate encyclopedia, then put a ton of money into not only making it easily accessible and cheap, they brought in new editors, they, brought, they really built an encyclopedia business. And this physical CD owned the school market. If you wanted to say who's the most successful encyclopedia in the world, it was Microsoft and Carta. Now, at the same time, so you're looking at something like, you know, 2000, this little thing called Wikipedia starts. And Wikipedia was a bunch of, you know, programmer geeks who said, hey, let's let anyone edit something. And they sort of built around it, but it was really a ragtag group with a piece of software. And what happened was, if you looked at them as those things, Encarta owns the market. Encarta is building on the success of previous generations of encyclopedias. Encarta, Microsoft, was building the foundations that allowed encyclopedias to succeed for literally centuries. And Wikipedia is this brand new thing that just lets the riffraff in. Who would you have predicted would win that? I mean, I would have put a lot of money on Microsoft. I would. I wish I, you know, I'm glad I didn't. But I, you know, what happened is over time, Encarta closed. Wikipedia took off. Why is that? Well, it turns out that there was a fundamental different underlying philosophy, which was that Wikipedia not only sort of got the idea of crowdsourcing and bringing expertise from everywhere together, but it was fast and it was nimble. And particularly for its target market, which was the internet, it was up to speed on technology instantaneously, pop culture instantaneously, whereas Encarta would have to go through this long editorial process. Now, if you're sitting there going, Dave, I've heard you before, and I've heard this example. Please stop using it. It's so dated. Let me give you another one. Here's a little company that's having some trouble. This is one of the first internet breakthrough companies of the universe, right? The idea that they started creating and cataloging the entire internet in 13 categories to the point where every library, and you know if you were around, you did it too, you had to change your front page to have 13 categories, and let's make these easy links and all this other stuff. And Yahoo has really kept going and going. First, they gave away search. They said, all right, we used to be a search company. Now we can't keep up, so we'll just license someone else's. And then they became the news portal. And they just sort of lurched from step to step and wondered why, when they lurched from place to place, right, so now the landing page, that it wasn't sticking and growing again. And what they were trying to do is anytime someone was successful, they sort of zipped all their resources there. And if the success changed, they zipped over there. And so Yahoo's had a real trouble because it doesn't fundamentally understand what allowed it to succeed in the first place. And that's what it comes down to, is what we have is when we think about a planning process, when we think about planning for the future, we have a system that looks roughly like this, right? You have a vision, we are going you know, to be the wonderful library of the world. You have some mission, we're going to do it through X, Y, Z turns into a strategy, we're going to do this and then this and prioritize this and here's how the resources are going to be allocated to finally execution, right? So there's the sense that there's a nice progression from a vision to an execution. The problem with this model is it's missing something. It's missing the fact that all of these visions and missions and strategies are founded on something much more fundamental and something often ignored that is more important and that is a worldview. If you look at, for example, libraries as in the book business, then your vision is going to be awfully bookish, and your mission is going to be bookish, and your strategy is going to be bookish, and your execution. But if I said, was well, that because your, your worldview was about books? And you'd be like, no, it's about libraries. It's about being very innovative. Worldviews change the questions we can even ask. They, they open up questions, and do they matter or don't they matter? I'll give you an example. The MacArthur Foundation asked me to answer this question. They said, Dave, what is the future of libraries? Go for it. Now, if they had been nice and simply said, from your own point of view, I would have been done, right? Because clearly I know. But they said, you know, survey, look across the literature, look across the people, tell us what is the future of libraries. Now, I'm an academic. And in academic ease, the question is the most important thing that you can come up with. Questions are the currency of the realm. And it turns out that this question sucks. 
This is a bad question. It's a horrible question because it makes some assumptions. For example, it makes the assumption that there is one future. It makes the assumption that that future is determined, right? That we're headed towards it. It's there. It's unchangeable. It's fixed. We're headed towards it. In essence, what's behind this question is a worldview. It's a deterministic worldview. It's a worldview that says the, the, the exigent strategies, the ways that the larger forces of the world, government and business and people's desires and technology are going to shape that future and we are then going to inherit it. But what if we change the question? What if we challenge the worldview? For example, what should be the future of libraries? You know, if, if I told you today that the future of libraries is they're gone, and there are plenty of places that you've already seen that, right? The future, the libraries are obsolete. They'll be obsolete. And Forbes at least gave us a date, right? They'll be by 2020. We won't need them. Are you okay with that? Are, are you okay if uh, libraries go away? If you are, I think that what I ask, what are you doing in the profession, sort of managing the decline? That doesn't sound very inspiring. So the question becomes, well, wait a minute, what should it be? What do I want it to be? What's my vision of it? And suddenly the idea becomes, wait, I can help control it. By the way, I see something about libraries will never go away, they'll only evolve. But so let me ask you a, a, a peer question. What if the future of libraries is that they succeed, but we don't have librarians anymore? Or what if we have plenty of librarians, but we don't have libraries anymore? Those are possible futures. Do you like them? Do you like either one of them? Would you fight for one of them? Once again, by just changing the question, we show that we are looking at the world a different way. Let's keep going with this one. So we've got what should be the future of librarians. How about the future of libraries and librarians? Right? The truth is that when you think about it and you look at the mission statement and you look at the idea of uh, what a library is here to do, what our vision is and such, a lot of them start with the library is eternal and forever. And then we hire librarians to make that happen, right? That's the, the was it, the Danville statement. Is that it? Or are librarians creating libraries? You know, what is the role of these two people? And once again, they can be separated. The famous line about we're the only profession named after our building. No, we're not. Accountants were named after counting houses. It used to be that, you know, in Darwin, in, in sorry, Dickens Day, Scrooge, you brought your records to a counting house and they would do your records for you and send back the business. But what happened is people suddenly realized they could hire these people to work internally. They wouldn't have to walk across those windy streets. Um, they would have the ability to have much more confidentiality in their information, and they could use their expertise to project and forecast different models. And so what happened was the field of accounting has exploded and become more and more important in modern times, but the counting houses were down to four, right? The idea here that they've consolidated, they've moved in different ways. Once again, what should be that future? Let's keep playing down this line. Now, we live in the US, and I know this is an international conference, so please excuse me if this is a very US comment. But I know the folks in New Zealand, you guys have a democracy. In Australia, you guys have a democracy. So the idea being that, at least in the US, but where I've been, where I've visited, the, one of the main justifications behind libraries is democracy, that we have an informed we have a informed public. We have an informed citizenry that can learn about the issues, read about the issues, be informed about the issues, be active, because we know that democracy is not simply a vote and forget. It's constant engagement with civil institutions and obligations on the part of the citizen to oversee the government, be part of the government, watch the government, criticize the government, help form the government. Right? But when I went and looked through this, what we found was that libraries were much concerned about what's the latest gizmo and gadget and technology than what was their role in democracies. I mean, if you're in an institution, by the way, academic institutions have at their core the idea that of an informed democracy, marketplace, and country and society. If you're in a public library, if you're in a school library, public or private, I ask you, you evaluate how many people walk into your library, you evaluate how many circulations of books, do you evaluate your impact on democracy? When you fill out those journals at the end of the day, I answered this many reference questions, I shelved this many books, I improved democracy by this percentage. Does having a public library in a community lead to more informed voting? Does it lead to greater voter turnout? If we feel that these are important for democracy and we feel libraries are important for democracy, why haven't we connected these things together other than the rhetoric of to be informed is to be good in democracy? Worldviews matter here. 
right? If you think that democracy simply happens and we are part of it, then why ask this question? But if you think democracy is shaped by institutions and individuals, shouldn't it be part of the question? So then we come to something like this. So the mission of librarians, and this is the mission statement that I am out evangelizing for. I put it into a book called The Atlas of New Librarianship. And it says the mission of librarians is to improve society through facilitating knowledge creation in their community. All right? So, okay. Right? But we can debate that. Well, the major debates around this mission go something like, I'm a teacher. That's mine. I'm a journalist. That's my mission. I'm Google. That's my mission. Right, so why is this library specific? And there are a few reasons, which is this is not enough to define librarianship. But I want you to look at it for a couple of other things. The first is it's a two-part mission. The second part is facilitating knowledge creation in our communities, in essence, helping the community learn and be better informed. But the second part is actually an ethical counterbalance to the, the first part's an ethical counterbalance to the second. That is to say, the improve society part which is there are some questions that shouldn't be answered or should be answered in a given way. When you have a, an eighth grader walking up to your school librarian and they say, give me the answer, no school librarian worth their salt would simply look it up and say five, right? We use that as a teachable moment, as an opportunity to hopefully get them interested in the learning process. That improves society, teaching someone how to learn, not simply giving them the fact, is part of our mission to improve society. We see that in academic institutions and in public institutions. It's the basis behind information literacy instruction, which is simply getting an answer is insufficient to be truly part of an information age. You need the instructional part as well. But let's just take it for a moment and say, hey, I do that. Think of the most retrograde stereotypical, doesn't exist, but you know it's going to show up on a sitcom somewhere library with full of buns and shushing and stacks everywhere, right? Think of the most, most conservative bastion of old style librarianship that frankly has never existed, right? But put that stereotype up there. Could they say that's their mission too? And the short answer is yes. That the mission itself doesn't define, once again, the worldview. The mission of libraries is to improve society. I do that. I provide access to reading materials and quality literature. Through facilitating knowledge creation, I answer reference questions. In their communities, we're a public library. We open our doors at 10 o'clock every morning and close them only at 4.30, except on Sundays where we're closed. Right? The idea here is that this mission statement, your mission statement, this strategic planning process is insufficient to truly talk about what a library can be. And we're in the midst of a world where we are changing that worldview. That the worldview, I'll give you an example. I want to change one thing in this mission statement. It's change, add one piece to the worldview, which is think about how you accomplish this mission statement given this comment, that knowledge is created through conversation. Now, I'm not going to spend another hour going through conversation theory and learning theory and pedagogy and constructivism versus objectivism, but just take it for a moment that critical thinking skills, the notion of someone as an as a active reader of information, someone as an engaged learner, right? In, in, in education, we don't talk about teaching anymore. We talk about learning. The notion isn't that I can teach you something. I can't teach you anything. If you don't want to listen, then it doesn't matter. In fact, most of my job as an instructor is to focus your attention. I do that through waving my hands around in deep voices and talking really loudly. But you're probably looking over my shoulder wondering why are my academic robes there? And by the way, where are you? And is that a cool headset? And if you're doing that, I can't teach you anything. So the notion that knowledge is created through conversation means that the learner is in charge. And there's a dialogue going back and forth. Most of that dialogue is actually with ourselves, arguing about do I believe it, don't I believe it, et cetera. Uh, and yes, by the way, um, a lot of those conversations can be quiet and reflective, but a lot of them are loud. And, and the more I hear about patrons saying libraries should be quiet, I, I really think that we haven't done our job teaching people what they should expect from a library. We're really asking them to expect a little too little from their library. We need to expect them to say, this is a cauldron of ideas and knowledge. This is the place where the future gets created. You know what? Sometimes that's a loud process. But I have quiet room over here for you. So taking this worldview, we can come back to our mission statement and say, OK, what do you mean by mission? What do you mean by librarians? What do you mean by improved society, et cetera? And so let's break that down and see how different worldviews define these ideas differently. 
So in a collection-centric worldview, where, and I would say this is the worldview that is still widely held in libraries, but I would say, and maybe optimistically, it is a worldview that I find in the decline. The worldview of new librarianship, of libraries being about communities, about being conversation and learning, where artifacts such as books and journals and magazine and web pages are important, but of secondary importance to the dialogue and the interactions that occur. That your true collection is not what's on your shelves or licensed through your databases, but are the people who walk through the door, and more importantly, the people who will never walk through your door, but need to engage in learning activities. So if we look at those two worldviews and we take things like, what is a mission? The mission of a collection-centric institution is a li that the mission of the library is to distribute content um, to create knowledge. In essence, we're in the knowledge creation business, but the way we do it is we give you something and you go create the knowledge. Have a good time. It's a passive, right? I see this in academic libraries enough. It's the professor's job to teach the students. It's our job to equip the professor and the students to learn somewhere else. Right, this is where my favorite quote ever, Joan Fry Williams, talks about how libraries need to be more like kitchens and less like grocery stores. Right, a grocery store is where you go and you get all the ingredients, you walk out the door. The kitchen's where the action is. I don't know about you, but whenever I have a party of more than three people, literally, the kitchen is where the action is because it's the idea of a point of creation and conversation and social. In new librarianship, the mission is facilitation. The mission, by the way, of the librarian and the library can also be different that your personal mission as a librarian may not be the same as a library. And in fact, you know that already because you've been in libraries where you've gone, that's a, I don't, why do we do that? And by acknowledging that they're different, we can begin to, to deal with those conflict issues. That when we talk about knowledge in this collection-centric worldview, knowledge is actionable information. It can be stored and organized as knowledge containers. In essence, the knowledge is on the stack. The knowledge is in the databases. The knowledge is waiting for you to sort of open up your head and pour it in, right? This is interesting. In the new librarianship, knowledge is uniquely human. It's only up here. It's completely dynamic. It changes every minute of every day. And it can be used to create artifacts that can be stored and organized. In essence, if you buy my book, you don't get my knowledge. You don't just get to hold the book up or run it through your eyes in the form of characters going blindly into your brain and say, now I know what Dave knows. When you read that book, you may know something radically different, like Dave is an idiot, or I totally disagree, or I'm going to steal that idea, or not quite. That's the internal dialogue that you're having. When you're reading a book, you're not talking to the book, you're not talking to the author, you're talking to yourself. And that means that we, we treat knowledge. If we're in the knowledge business, guess what? we got to get into that messy conversation as well. We improve society in a collection-centric view indirectly. We collect the stuff, the community, society takes the stuff and does something cool with it. Right? Our ultimate goal is to go to the presidential nominees, hand them the right information so they'll make the right decisions, and then they'll improve society. Uh -uh. In new librarianship, we seek to have transformative social engagement. It is not enough to stand by and wait for someone to come in, to have a library, to have a school library, to have an academic library, to have a library of any sort means that community needs to be better, which means we need to get out of them often. We need to look at the impact we have. We need to say, because in 2012 I was here in New Zealand, New Zealand is better. And it has to be a direct connection. When we look at communities in a collection-centric view, communities are collections of users customers, consumers, people who come in, graze, and then depart. I hate the word user. I hate it. I'm in Syracuse University where we've championed it, and I still hate it. To me, it sounds like hep chick, politically incorrect, totally ac in acronistic, and inaccurate. In new librarianship, we have members, or neighbors, if you want to call them, friends, if you want to call them that. There are people who are co-owning the library. We're here with them. We're part of them. And by the way, they, the user, the customer, the consumer, the member, only owns half the conversation. Librarians have a say too. We have a voice as a community member to talk about what do we mean by improve and better. And we're not passive wallflowers being wait, be, be, waiting to be told what's right or wrong. We're actively going out. Right? In e-books, we don't like how publishers are treating us. And I am so thrilled that at least in the U.S., but I've talked about it, I've talked with folks working on it in the Netherlands and all around the country, librarians are fed up and saying we're not going to just wait 
for publishers to come up with a self-serving model that, frankly, they're desperately trying to figure out, we're going to be actively saying to our communities and then to the publishers with the communities behind us, this is what needs to happen. This is why it needs to happen. This is what we need to bring on. Facilitating in a collection-centric view is providing equitable access. Our job is to get you to the collection and do so regardless of age and gender and socioeconomic status. In new librarianship, access is important, but it's only one thing out of many that we do to facilitate. If I get access to a really brilliant book and I can't read, have you truly provided me access? Or it's in Chinese and I don't speak Chinese. No, librarians need to be involved not simply in access, but the knowledge to handle what they're accessing. And I mean handle in the sense of read, engage, understand, mentally prepare for what they're reading. We do it through an environment, an environment in our physical buildings and our virtual buildings and the relationships we build that not only enable people to feel safe when they're doing this, intellectually safe, physically safe, but inspired when they do this. And by the way, an inspirational setting has something to do with architecture, but it can be, but we can overcome architecture. I've been in some really old rundown libraries that have been brilliant and wonderful to be part of because the librarians are doing such amazing stuff, the walls disappear out of my head. As librarians, do we define a librarian in a collection-centric view as employees of the library? The collection's our main goal. Now we need stewards of that. Or do we define librarians as those that create the library? Now, this is one where I tend to get pushback. Wait a minute, I got hired. I didn't get, I didn't get to make it up myself. But aren't you now? I mean, if you're a librarian and you're working in a library and you don't feel you have any influence on the institution, isn't that frustrating as hell? We create the library. Now, this is, goes back to those questions about what's the future of libraries and librarians. We have the ability to say, I want to be like the accountant. I want to see the librarian profession bust out of these buildings and be everywhere. Or I want these institutions to be crucial, center points, aspirational institutions of our community, whether that's an academic community, school community, business community, geographic community, doesn't matter. Fine. You're going to create that. And you're going to co-create it with your community. You're going to get together and say, what's a library today? This amazing ability to walk into a library in central New York or New Zealand or Africa and have the exact same experience with the same stacks and the same Dewey Decimal System is insane. This idea that somehow cultures are radically diverse and crazy, except for the libraries, which are exactly the same. That's nuts, right? We need, instead of worrying about teaching people to come to some norm like McDonald's, we need to teach to shape ourselves around our communities and let us as librarians worry about standardizing mark records and transferring all this other stuff. What do you need to know as a community? Let's shape it around that. That's our job, not the community's job to learn our languages. So when we look at this new mission statement, how does this play out in, in practical means? And so we can look at things like, how do we share stuff, right? Because here's the trick. Libraries are not in the sharing business right now. Libraries are in the lending business right now. And if you're sitting there saying, what's the difference? They're synonyms. You're right, except of one major difference. Lending is when you build and own a collection and you allow access to it. Sharing is when everyone owns a collection and is willing to share access to it. So here's the problem that we have. Take a book. Yay, a book. And let's say it's a popular book. Let's say it's Harry Potter is what we used to use. Now we have to use Fifty Shades of Grey. I'm sure there's a much more popular book. I think that one just got knocked, knocked off the list. But let's just say, let, this is the book. This is the book. All right? Now, the question is, if you're serving one person, or in this case, four people, fine. Right? One person, they get the book. Right? There's one person waiting, they get it. But because we're lending it, because it's our book and not community resource of shared nature, what our book, the more people we get interested in using our services, the less access we provide to that book. Let me take it simple. I want Fifty Shades of Grey. I'm your only library member. Here it is. Oh, wait, now we have four library members, and they all want Fifty Shades of Grey. Either we've got to go buy more, or you'll be first, you'll be second, you'll be third, you'll be fourth. And we 
regulate, we ration access in all sorts of ways. It's popular, you're only allowed for a week, or oh, this is four weeks, oh, it's a DVD, only three days. But what we're doing is we're facing the reality that the more popular we become, the better service we provide, the more integrated we get into a community, the less access we're providing. That's the paradox. And that's the success paradox. The idea that the more successful we are at promoting what we do leads to greater failure in service to any individual. So what do we do? We do this all the time. Dave, I got this figured out. Where have you been for the last 50 years? We're in a consortium. We're part of lots of libraries that do this, right? So if we don't have a copy, we'll enter a library loan or get it from one of our branches, et cetera. <laughs> Problem solved. Thanks for the speech. Except, of course, those institutions have audiences as well. And so what we're doing is we're taking the itty-bitty little extra capacity we have and we're amplifying it by taking everyone else's itty-bitty capacity. And already today, is usage has gone up of public libraries in the U.S. and around the world, we're seeing that those capacities are shrinking and shrinking. And you're seeing things like, well, I don't care if we had lending privileges before. Now you've got to buy a library card. Now you've got to rent it. We're rationing again. This only goes so far. Now let's talk sharing. The sharing model is different because what we say is, see, all those dots and people around that, they got stuff too. In Ann Arbor District Library, uh, one of the, the, the members came in and talked to Eli Nyberger, their associate director of technology, brilliant guy. And, and the guy said, you know how I can check out a book from the library? And Eli's like, yeah. You know how I can use that system there to find out if that book's available in any of the other branch libraries? You know, I was like, yeah. I got books at home. Can't we put those in the system? I'm willing to share them. So if someone comes and says they want one of my books, the next day I'll come drop it off. Now, in a lending model, that's insanity. That's not part of our collection. We can't be guaranteed of delivery dates. We, it hasn't been cataloged. Oh, my goodness, we won't do it. But in the sharing model, it makes perfect sense. The idea that communities have resources and we can share those back and forth becomes important. And not only books, but they have pictures and maps and apps and expertise. What's happening in libraries all around the country is they're bringing in speakers from the community to lecture and teach classes and share their knowledge. The idea that we can network not only and share not only things and stuff and artifacts, that's collection centric, but we can share people and ideas and concepts and arguments and we can share dreams and aspirations and we can share whole new ways of viewing the world. That's an exciting collection. That's a collection that if you yawn at Fifty Shades of Grey, try yawning at someone who looks at you and says, I'm into that, right? I'm just saying, it changes the world a lot. This forms the basis then for the library, not as a place, not as a collection, but as a platform. And a platform built by librarians in cooperation and co-owned by their community. So what can we do with this platform? Well, we can still have people come and share stuff from us, right? There's a core collection. We know that one of the essential natures of a library is as collective buying agent, that we can take small pools of resources from individual units and people and faculty and taxes and tuition, and we can pool those together to buy things that no individual would be able to afford. Still important. We know that we can build a collective good where people may not have access to them on their own. Important. But through the exact same network, people can share their own materials and their own ideas and themselves. One of my favorite ideas is a prejudice library where you can go check out a prejudice. It's going through Europe right now. Right? Never talk to a Muslim, check out a Muslim. Never talk to a Jew, check out a Jew. Never talk to a black, check out a black. Never talk to a gay, check out a gay. And you sit there and you go, ooh. But why, libra why libraries to do that? Because not because we're checking out but because it's a civic environment, that the library is a trusted place, a trusted institution, a trusted platform where you can have those encounters, those discussions, and still have the benefits of intellectual freedom, the idea of a lack of oversight and a lack of critique, privacy. The platform we have can be used more than sharing stuff we own. It can be used for sharing the whole community, the whole community's fears and thoughts and aspirations and problems but we can share this together. So I come back to this point, and then I think we'll have a conversation. This point is that when we talk about the worldview of librarianships, we have a choice. Worldviews um, are not built into us. Worldviews, in fact, as a concept, came out of the idea that we're making these up. 
uh, we talk about Kuhn, uh, a, a physicist, talked about the nature of scientific revolutions. And what he did is you may not know the name Kuhn, but you know what he came up with, which is the idea of a paradigm shift. What he was is he was given the, uh, the task of teaching a history of science class. And, you know, you start at Aristotle and you start at, the, you know, the, the, the Artemis screw and then you move up to Galileo and then you move in, right? That you show the natural progression of knowledge and truth through the ages. Because as scientists, what we are doing is building bricks of knowledge into a wall of understanding. And what he found was it doesn't work like that. When he went back to look at, at Archimedes as an engineer and he put modern engineering eyes and he looked at how he thinks of mechanics, he said, this is wrong. This is screwed up. This makes no sense. But what he realized was if you look at what he did in relation to his contemporaries, this is brilliant. This was a massive step forward. And what he realized is as we look at science, the most objective physical, impassive thing, which it's not, and said, even here what we've seen is worldviews matter. And what he found was, for example, in any dominant field, library and information, science, physics, what have you, there's a dominant worldview, a dominant concept, a paradigm in his words. And what happens is the whole group says, this is where it is, and it's that group think idea, Ooh, we shall build commons, we shall build commons. And then what he said is, what happens is people new to the field, either they're young or newly entered to the field, by and large, not always, but by and large, would form these little pockets around the fringe. And they begin talking to each other going, you know, I, I hear the chant, but there's something that bothers me, some data that doesn't fit. And they haven't found the data that doesn't fit because they didn't even know to look for it. And then if you add that new data into this big equation, it falls apart. And these little pockets suddenly grow into the new mainstream in a paradigm shift. We're in the middle of that right now in librarianship. We are in the middle of a massive paradigm shift. And I know that sounds terribly overused, but in Kuhn's sense, in the sense of a new worldview. And this new worldview is not changing librarianship. And it, here's the thing, just like the old worldview changed librarianship from an older worldview that changed librarians from an older worldview. There was a time when information was so scarce and books so precious we had to chain them to the shelves that to get had access to this you had to go to a shelf and you could only move 12 inches away to read this document. Then the world changed. Information in books became not the most valuable resource. It was the people and the work they could accomplish and so we threw off the chains. But here's what's important to know. We could not have thrown off the chains if we still lived in a worldview where books were the most precious resource in the library. We had to change how we saw the world to the people being the most important worldview. When Melville Dewey came around, he changed the worldview of libraries from unique collections to efficiency, effectiveness, and standardization as the means of progress. And we bought it. We bought it to the point that now that we've passed the industrial age, now that we're past standardization, now that we're past paternalistic views of what literature is important and not, it's holding us back. But we don't know what new question to ask. And the paradigm, that's the old paradigm. The old paradigm of it's the stuff, stupid. It's the collection, it's the materials. We, we have the equivalent of putting the chains back on ourselves this time where the chains are holding us from trying new things and innovating in new ways and fixating on tools and not on outcomes and impacts. We are fixated on what we can circulate, what we can stack, what we can count, what we can move, what we can process, and what we do, and not why it matters, not why we do it. And that paradigm has been shaken so fundamentally by the internet, by the web, by new technologies and new tools from moving from a world of information scarcity to a world of information abundance that we're scared as hell. And we look to our past success. We need bitter collections. We need more popular. We need ebooks. Quick, stat, give me 300 popular ebooks that we're trying to replicate the past success in hopes that it will lead to future success. And as we've already talked about, that doesn't always work. Instead, we see a growing paradigm that says, you know what? 
books are great. I love books. They're fabulous. They're the most powerful invention that man has developed to transfer, really provoke knowledge from place to place. And they're important, but they're less important than the people who are reading them and impact. They're less important than the work we need to accomplish. The means and tools and functions of our delivery, the functions of libraries, are less important than the impact and the dreams and the aspirations we can succeed and make a reality within our community. That's the business we're in. If you want to talk about why you became a librarian because you love to read, great. Because you love to get good at crossword puzzles, delightful. I got a new task for you. Make the world a better place. And if you're unprepared to do that or you find that terribly frightening, that's okay. Because when you move beyond your comfort zone, you do something absolutely sublime. You learn. You try, you experiment, you test, you become a new person. You stretch, you fail, and you try again, and you try again, and you learn more than you ever thought you could accomplish before. Our libraries will survive, will succeed, will thrive. But they won't thrive because they have in the past, and we're not going to return to the 1950s. They will thrive because we understand the truth of what we do is not enable reading, is not enable borrowing. The truth of what we do is we unleash human potential and passion to make the world a better place. That's a vision I can get behind. And yes, it involves details of how do we classify, how do we categorize, where does our metadata go, how do we interlibrary loan. I get that. But if we don't do it for the larger purpose, if we simply do it because we've always done it, or we don't want to hurt someone's feelings, or we do it out of tradition, or we do it out of institutional inertia, then we have failed in our primary missions, and we have failed our communities, which are the greatest assets that we bring to any table. That's the worldview that we need. That's the effort that we need to put in. That's the basis of us working on new tools and new strategies, new technologies, new marketing, new messaging, new advocacy comes from that core of librarians as noble, moral, high ground crusaders for the good of our communities. We are radical, positive change agents that seek to change the world, that have a voice in how that world is developed, and do it in concert with the community so closely that you cannot see the light between us. That's the power that we bring to this task. That's our ability to change the world. That's what we need to do. Thank you. Those are my comments, and I look forward to taking some questions online, either through chat or Steve. I don't know if we have another way of doing that. We can let people take the microphone. If you would like to ask a question by uh, microphone, you can raise your hand virtually. That's the third icon over in the participant window. Um, yeah, that, that was quite a, a rousing finish. We're all sort of stunned here. Or you can put a note in the chat, and uh, I'll try and capture that. If you put a question in the chat before, I probably didn't see it, and I would uh, just ask that you post it again. So please feel free to raise your hand or put a, a question in the chat. Thank you all very much. I, I really appreciate it. David, um, I, I put a quote in there from Wikipedia. I went looking because some of what you described reminded me a lot of the Lyceum movement. Mm -hmm. um, is there a connection for you in that? Uh, I have to say I'm not um, completely familiar with the Lyceum movement. So um, I, I belong to one at one point. <laughs> but I, I, I can't comment. <laughs> Well, I don't know that I actually know that much about it, but it was sort of the <laughs> transcendentalist, and it was this vision of places around the country where there were lectures and debates and conversation and dialogue. Yeah, and, and I love uh, the general purpose. I, I, there's a library, I believe it's in Baltimore, which is not a library. It's a sort of community ground where they have materials and books, but it's this fomenting of ideas coming together. Um, Cleveland Public Library, um, Sarah, when Sari Feldman was there, was working around the concept of the agora, being a sort of open marketplace of ideas and business and marketplace coming together to talk about it. You know, it is the community meeting ground. It's that platform. I don't dismiss the physicality of libraries, for example, because having a place is an important part of a platform, but it's not the only part of a platform. You know, some people say, Dave, I work in a library. People come in, they want books, they want to leave. They shush, they get or whatever. And I, I ask them, how many options have you given them to do otherwise? If I walk into a room and I see a reference desk here and stack upon stack upon stack and a row of computers all facing away from each other, 
what have you said, and by the way, turn off your cell phone, the most important piece of technology most of us own, and connection to the world, and say, okay, what am I going to do there? Well, one, I'm going to be quiet. Two, I'm going to go through the stacks. And three, I'm going to check out books. I love using my public library to check out books. I do. I haven't been given many options to do otherwise. And so if we use different terminology, um, in Toronto, they're renaming the library the people's place. Um, they, they, in Colorado, they have the AnyThink library. Some people are talking about renaming, uh, merging museums and libraries. We give them opportunities to do different things. Museums went through this. You walk into an art museum, it's once again, shush, quiet, dim lighting, guards to tell you not to touch anything. You walk into a science museum, and it's crazy, loud, kids running around, that's the best thing ever. Our environment set up what people are willing to do. So we can talk about conversation all we want, but if we don't work at our physical spaces, we're not going to do it. Also, we found, we looked at policies for physical spaces, right? Acceptable use policies, you know, what you can and cannot do, ejection policies, and we found it was all about socialization and being in a civic environment. You're too loud, you're too obnoxious, you're disruptive, we can kick you out. We looked at all the policies for online and digital environments, and they were all, don't steal this, don't steal that, and it was all about a user end user agreement, nothing about what you're allowed to blog about, because of course we don't let them blog. What you can do in a social context, because of course we don't let them do social context, we can get sued. So the Lyceum we need to extend not only within our physical settings, but also in our virtual settings. I'm sorry. I love um, it. I see some questions popping up here. So I'm, I'm tracking some of them. There was a question about your okay. favorite public library and or academic library. Oh, I could get myself in such trouble. I will name some of my favorite public <laughs> libraries. Uh, my, my favorite public library is the Fayetteville Free Library, just about 20 minutes um, east of here, just because they're a very inventive place. They were one of the first public, they were the first public library with a maker space in it, but they're dedicated to learning and learning new things. Even how they use their space is fascinating. I was so blown away by the Portland Public Library in Oregon, uh, just because it's downtown in the midst of pedestrian, and every public library, central library I've ever been in complains about parking, and clearly, clearly there was none here but it was packed in full. Um, I think that, that I love certain programs with the, with the Free Library of Philadelphia did around the question of homelessness. It forever makes me tear up by, by their engagement. Um, I think that there's some up-and-coming libraries like the Chattanooga Public Library that are doing fabulous things. I love the inventiveness of the uh, Cuyahoga County Public Library outside of Cleveland and Sari Feldman, what she's doing there. Academic libraries, um, University of Washington in Seattle has got an amazing library, not only physical space, which is inspiring, but the services they put out, what they're doing. I love, I think it's Yale that started the idea of concierge librarianship. You're a new freshman, you've set up a time with a librarian, and they walk you through not just how to use the library, how to get on classes, how to check your grades, really all the survival tips you need when you're 18 and away from home. So that's just some of them, the, the North Carolina State University Library is, is inventive and amazing and developing new thoughts all the time. Um, so there are a bunch of them. Uh, you know, it, it's like asking me to, this is going to sound so paternalistic. It's like asking me to choose between my children. It's like asking me to pick between <laughs> noble organizations. There are so By many way, questions coming. I'm going to keep moving I, forward. Okay. Oh. Sorry, it scrolled past me there. What are a few examples of how you are implementing these concepts where you work? Well, um, I'm a uh, professor in an academic unit at Syracuse University, so I don't work in a library and I don't administer a library. However, I do work at Syracuse University, and so we have regular conversations with, um, with library staff. But I'd also like to point out that this isn't just about what happens in a library. So I have library science students. And we started really, we made a decision that with our curriculum, with library science students, we weren't going to simply talk historically. This is what you have, these types of libraries, here are the number of libraries, here's the evolution of libraries over time. They get some of that, but we were really going to talk about the role of librarians and the role of the sort of social participatory obligations of librarianship. And something very interesting and absolutely in, in hindsight predictable happened, which is the students rebelled. The students didn't rebel from the curriculum, they rebelled from the fact that they entered the curriculum hearing about librarians being powerful and changing the world, and then they would take too many classes that were about how to work in a library. And so what they did, and this is what really blew me away, is rather than, you know, 
anyone who has a degree in librarianship can talk about the deficiencies of their degree in librarianship. But what they did is they didn't simply complain and say, oh, this sucks and whatever. They started to change it. They organized sessions. They said, you don't provide enough hands-on technology. We said, okay. And they said, but don't worry. We have this speaker coming in. Stephen Abrams coming in the next day. We have this person who's agreed to do content DM. This person's going to teach us Drupal. And I was like, okay. And they said, we don't have enough access or connections with the librarians around us. So we're going to start a discussion group now where we're going to teach, when we teach LAMP, when we teach technology, we're going to invite the local librarians, public, academic from around the world to come in. And so my implementation, not in a library sense, but in my day-to-day -day effort, has been to realize that the curriculum I teach needs to be just as participatory and open as the organizations we want to create. One of the lines I use a lot is, how can you expect radical positive learning and change in your community if as an agency you are yourself not committed to being a radical positive change agent to take that on? And that came right up into my face which said, okay Dave, here's students, they want to radically positively change things, what are you going to do? Change the curriculum. We created whole new mechanisms to get them credit for the work they were doing on their own. We're talking about implementing project-based systems. All of these things are slowly making their way to change the culture I work in. Okay, I think we have time for one more question because we do have to break for the next set of sessions. Sorry, um, Ramble. How do you how do you suggest students entering the library workforce embody these concepts when facing those clinging to older ways? <laughs> I am. Um, I am a great advocate. The reason I use change agent and not leader is that when I looked around at curriculum material, leader was often defined as someone who points in the right direction, yells loudly like this and says, let's go. And what I really wanted was someone who could find, who go to a situation with, a, with an older school, not older age-wise. I will not play that game. I know brilliant older librarians who get this much more than anyone who just came out of school. Way of working with people with another worldview, you take them out to lunch a couple times, you drop donuts off, you really woo them to change and find their passion. This is a big thing. You're new to a library, don't go in and say everything you've done is wrong. Find the passion that led to what they're doing and then suggest a new way in which they can still realize that passion. And the idea is that you help people not, because it's not that it's your idea, it's their, you're all working at it together. So my short answer is identify them, woo them, find their passion, figure out, brainstorm with them ways of realizing that passion, and then, frankly, if they refuse to change or refuse to move, figure out how to get them the hell out of the way. David, thank you so much. That was really a lot of fun. I appreciate your, your own personal passion and interest. Um, I'm clapping for you. It's really hard to find the applause icon now in this new <laughs> but it's under the smiley face. Click on applause. Folks, we do want to let you get to the next sessions. We've got lots more left today, but this is the final night. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks to David. Take care, everybody. Bye now. Bye, everybody.